Okay, uh, to look at the previous one, then it's not that bad. Please change the reference frame and see it from my point of view. Obviously, there's a certain amount you want to make these videos or at some point you're in saturation. It, effectively, I had most of them last year, but the microphone, my microphone was broken. So the sound quality was all too bad. Now I have to record them again. In fact, I realized this quite early, but then trying to get one from UWS was impossible. So effectively, I had to buy it for my private money a microphone so I can do my job. I was a bit pissed off. But so now, just to explain that at some point, uh, I've came to accept a certain quality. If it's not 100% perfect, oh, I hope you understand this. So, okay, now back to energy, masses, energy, deforming space. Let me share the screen. Okay, then, oh. Here we go. So basically, this explains then if we would have such a potential sink or potential well. And the moon has a certain energy, it's like in a marble run. If there's no friction, it will be always at the same height. So this would explain why bodies orbit around other orbits. Uh, other bodies. So, <clears throat> now it's the question, what happens to the photon? Photon is massless. It should not be affected by gravity. So a light particle, light wave. Then there is the mass principle that the light wave will always travel the shortest way it can. Whoa. And now, according to Einstein, the shortest way through such a potential sink might not be the straight line as it appears. So this light ray, the star emits light, and then we would expect the light to travel straight on. It might be if space is deformed that it's shorter to go basically around in a curve. Strange principle, but Geometry delivers this. What means stars that are that we know that should be behind our sun, for example, appear now because we think that the light goes straight on, appear to be on a different position. This is a direct prediction that comes out of the general theory of relativity. So the object appears at different. This is basically like with a lens, you can make similar effects, change the position of an object in the picture to appear. So this is then some kind of gravitational lensing. So it was basically predicted 1950. Then there was a Sun darkness of, so in 1917, somewhere in Kenya, so in Africa, Western Africa. And there, a guy who knew about astronomy and the position of stars, who knew there should be one star that should be behind the sun, took care and observed it next to the sun. So basically this picture, as you see it here, nicely realized by this guy. Seemingly wrote in a letter to Einstein, to neutral Switzerland. You were right. This gravitational lensing exists. I have observed. What does Einstein? He gets this letter. He ran to his mama, to his mother. Mama, 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 I was right. Oh. 
by this time he must have been already very well established probably already had the Nobel Prize for his uh, works towards quantum mechanics as explanation of the photo effect that light basically can take out electrons from the surface as light has also prop properties of particles. Okay, so this effect exists. Okay, now if we have such an object that is behind, obviously light cannot be only bent here, it can also could pass us here, and then it's bent here to come to us. Or it goes underneath and this is bent over. And then we would not observe basically the star at the wrong position. What we would observe is the star as a circle, a so-called Einstein ring. This is then shown here. So basically we have a, a foreground galaxy. We are here on Earth and observe, of course, here is the Hubble Space Telescope as our eye. We have another telescope. Then we look at an object which has a big mass and is nearby. Foreground galaxy, so for example, or galaxy cluster. And then we look, what we can see occasionally is that it's surrounded by such a ring or ring-like appearance that is now shown here in this picture. So we have the foreground galaxy and surround. And this is basically this gravitational lensing due to the gravitational sink of all these masses accumulated. So you have this individual dense and now you sum them up or you take if you want to reproduce this, you take a hammer and go to your car and hammer constantly on the, on the chassis. You get individual dents, but they obviously will add up. So, oh, please don't do this. <laughs> please not. <laughs> it's just a, a picture that hopefully helps you to visualize. So, Basically, we get this gravitational lensing going. Does this really affect? So if this is true, we should get photographs of it. And then we can take uh, what it does, the Hubble Space Telescope or other. Well, we see here the galaxy SDP81 is obviously a dark object, dark, massive object. Massive because otherwise, <laughs> Uh, the sink is not deep enough, the curvature of space is not big enough or not sufficient to make such an Einstein ring. And obviously there is something. Then here, this is an Einstein ring by a star, just a star and the star behind, or galaxy behind in the Horseshoe Nebula. So indeed, if we look Hubble with time. So this was the advanced camera for survey. Survey sounds like a big uh, wide opening angle where you observe loads of stuff at once. And oh, this seems to be quite a common phenomena that behind stars or galaxies, if there are objects behind, we get these Einstein rings. So indeed, There are guys that seem to be so smart enough that from this Einstein ring, they can calculate back what type of mass is to be in to make this kind of effect. I wonder how this works because you also lack the information how distant this object behind. Or it must be really smart guys. So mass corresponding to energy seems to deform space. Of course, it's just kind of statics and you put rubber sheet, you put your, your sphere on, the best of metal sphere, but quite a deep then, or table tennis ball, or a bit of a then. So obviously there seems to be some relation to the mass as well, and then energy. 
I, I personally don't like this rubber sheet picture too much because everybody uses it, but obviously there's a reason why. I wouldn't find a better explanation or to picturize the stuff. So hopefully we accept this. And then we have learned this other very important thing. Light is always traveling with the speed of light. Information takes time to travel through space. A light ray is produced and then it starts traveling and that takes its time. And at some point you will observe it. But then you observe basically there is something. Now you observe it, of course, only in the state it was when it, the light ray was emitted. So the sun emits the light. It takes eight minutes roughly for the light to travel to us. Then we observe. So we observe the sun as it was eight minutes ago. Very important concept. For example, maybe you heard that one and a half years, two years ago, there was Beetlejuice. It's one of the stars in Orion, uh, the top right shoulder, very reddish. It started to dim down quite drastically. It's usually the seventh bright sun, uh, night sky. And suddenly it was uh, top 30 only. Oh, lost quite some places. Sounds like my football team starting well and then whoosh. So it dimmed down, and then at some point it started going up again in the brightness. So it, I think it's no almost back to where it should be. But be the choose is all that we think it soon should disappear, explode. So very interesting stuff. Yet this dimming that we observed now, Beetlejuice is about 500 light years away. That means the light traveled already for 500 years. This means just when the light was emitted about the time, or this dimming happened really about the time when the Europeans have redis rediscovered America. Oh. Around 1500. Or found the way around the cable. Good hope to India. Oh, so suddenly, this was when this light was emitted and Beetlejuice was 500 years ago in this state. In the meantime, Beetlejuice might have already exploded. But the information hasn't reached us yet. Oh. Well, that's an event I, I, for me as a physicist, it would be absolutely great to observe this. And the good thing is Beetlejuice is just a far, it's far away, sufficiently far away that it would be very spectacular from our point of view. We would get a lot of uh, nitrogen oxide raining down. That's basically it. Maybe very good uh, uh, loads of ionized stuff in the top layers of our atmosphere, but that's it. Oh. So spectacular first row seat or second row seat, first row you don't want to have because then it's too violent. Yet, whether this happened in the last 500 years, we can't say. So in 500 years, we can then say, okay, back then when this guy was waffling, in front of a computer, like Madman. Big Jews was still okay. So, it's this very important concept. Light needs time to travel. But on the other hand, light this comes from 13.7 billion light years away, this light. It has been produced 13.7 billion years ago. So you can look back to the time, which is very close to just after the beginning of everything, the Big Bang. A very important concept. Please have there a couple of thoughts about 
and more. Or the light that we now see from the other edge of the Milky Way is traveling for 80,000 years. 80,000 years, this is about the time when we just have our ancestors just have left Africa. Oh. Uh, a couple of different uh, species of humans on this planet. Okay, but now we have considered so far what is that. So if you take a bucket of water, then you put a finger in the surface. While you put it in, you will see there are ripples going on. So basically press water away and this is forming a, a crest. Dip, crest, dip. This is moving away in concentric circle. This is the speed of sound. But once you keep your finger static, nothing is happening anymore. Remember with the electromagnetism, light was only produced when the two charges the vibrating. Okay, so if we want to change the space time, this, this deformation in rubber sheet, what we can take is, of course, take the mass over, change the mass drastically. This is an event we wait for when a supernova explodes, a star explodes, a massive star, which must be at least eight times heavier than our awesome. star, at least or probably uh, 15 to 20 times heavier. It happened 1987, 1987, but there we weren't so far that we could observe disturbances in space time. By now we can. Disturbances in space time by changing masses, this rubber sheet, of space time is now starting to vibrate. Like when you throw a stone in the water, put your finger in the water. Oh. Of course, another phenomena is that uh, with the distance, usually one over R squared, because what, we don't have uh, two dimensional stuff going on, we usually have three dimensional stuff. Except what is now to come, that is again two dimensional if we have two masses that are spiraling around each other. This is obviously happening in a plane. And the emission of these waves is also going in a plane. And this goes then with the, the intensity, goes then with the diameter, increasing diameter with the radius of the circle around, that is 2 pi, the radius, or directly proportional to the distance, or anti-proportional to the distance, you get the, the intensity dropping because it's now distributed over bigger and bigger and bigger circle. It's the same when you throw the stone in close to the impact point, you will have high waves, and then going away, the intensity, the, the height, until it's at some point so low that it's beyond our recognition, our sensitivity to detect this event. Oh. Now, of course, we could change masses by exploding the star, that is one thing. We could also by nipping the finger and letting a star disappears. So obviously, in order to have a big disturbance, we want a big mass that is changing. Or the other thing, if you take two fingers in the bucket of the water and then start rolling around, then you will, if you have them moving around each other, around the common center of gravity, these two masses, if you have them moving around, then you also disturb the surface. You also have suddenly waves going on. So if you have, if you find now two objects that trap each other, like sun and earth, in a common potential. So if we change masses, so somehow change masses, 
all their distribution by having spiraling them around. If you have this two finger spiraling, you will also change the, the system and it communicates again with the environment by the emission of waves. There it's water waves and now we have two masses spiraling around. So basically this dense, depending on the point of view, if it's perpendicular, you see just two next to each other. If then you see them behind each other, you might see it deeper and then less deep again, and then deep, less deep, deep, less deep. So constantly this is changing, and this is a, a ripple that goes through space time. And obviously, the intensity is also going down. There is this one over R because we have, are now working in a plane defined by this uh, movement. Oh. But obviously, in order to detect something, the, the masses must be big. It's not enough to have uh, two guinea pigs running around each other. It also causes gravitational waves, but this is there. Yeah, so, yeah. So, if we have this emission of gravitational waves, we have this periodic disturbance of space time. And according to Einstein, it propagates with the speed of light through space. Oh, but the deformation of space, you again change some kind of uh, this curvature. This is like when you take your rod that you have already bent and now you bend it uh, further, you need to invest some energy. It has to come from somewhere. Nature doesn't give us something for free and just releases energy. Oh, and the energy is taken from the potential energy that is now in this one over R squared in the gravitational law. So it basically shrinks the distance between the two objects. This is where the energy comes from to emit gravitational waves. But now they're coming closer and they need to, in order not to crash, I'm immediately into other spiral faster and faster and faster and faster. <laughs> so emit more and more and more and more. <laughs> and then obviously at some point the masses hit each other and probably start to merge. Oh, so objects come closer and closer and accelerate and we have this periodic disturbance. And here, I would now recommend you to have this film that basically shows the spiraling in of two massive masses. So stop this video, copy the link that you see here from the, from the uh, lecture slides. And then you will see the spiraling in of two, two big masses until they hit, hit each other, but then basically merge. Nothing is moving anymore. Silence. Well, gravitational wave we knew for a long time, indirectly, that they exist because when they spiral in the frequency, changes, obviously, it becomes faster and faster and faster. And we get their period shift. This has been for binary of two pulsars. Two, a pulsar is basically a fast rotating neutron star. And there is obviously one of these pulsars, a fast rotating, has trapped another one. And then they form such a system of two big masses that go around each other. Yet, these are still so far away that the disturbance in space-time is, is relatively small. They need to come closer to each other, which will be in about 200,000 years, the ones that here were observed. But we have seen there is this shift is going on. This period shift, somehow energy is, is taken out of the system. Is, is emitted, it's dissipating away. This 
was an indirect strong evidence there must be gravitational waves. This was done by this Russell, Alan Hals, and Joseph Houghton Taylor. But they got 1993 already the Nobel Prize, but means the publication must have been somewhere just before the 1990s. So indirectly already shown Einstein was right. Oh, but, well, usually the effect, <laughs> see here about uh, Einstein's possible reaction to guys starting trying to detect them directly to say, okay, hey, we are now going to observe gravitational waves. Yeah. <laughs> Good laughter. Okay. To give you a feeling, obviously the Earth and the Sun, they also orbit around the common center of gravity, which is given by the mass of one body, multiplied the length towards the center of gravity, plus the mass of the other body, which is obviously far, far smaller multiplied to the length, so basically some kind of lever. And the center, common center of gravity from Earth and Sun is probably very, very close to the center of the Sun because the mass is so much different. Oh. Yet, they do orbit around and they produce, this system produces gravitational waves. Oh, and since uh, here we have these gravitational waves emitted in this system, 200 watts. I mean, 200 joule for every second. What is this relative? What can you do with 200 joules? When I was a kid, you could have uh, five, five light bulbs on. Nowadays, you probably can run them. 40 or 50 light bulbs. That's a massive progress in terms of energy efficiency. But what is this? 200 watts. <laughs> then uh, you distribute this 200 watts over astronomical unit. <laughs> As the effect is so small, this is like a, well, uh, if I would be Franz Beckenbauer, I would say that's about the same effect as uh, Beckenbauer like to say this uh, dropping back of rice in China has on his life. But effectively not. So a couple of light bulbs. Unique bigger masses. You need the masses to be closer together. That the effect is really sizable. Even these two pulsars were well, no, not detectable yet. Well, in order to detect these small basic distortion in space time, that what there happens is the space gets a bit contracted or expanded, contracted, expanded, contracted, expanded in the direction of the wave. While in perpendicular, it stays the same way as it used to. Now you try to measure this. Very small effects. Even when the masses are big. There are people who came back to the old idea. So this is now what gravitational wave observatories. Here's LIGO. One of the predecessors is run by a British-German collaboration. It's the GEO 300 near Hanover. Same principle, interferometer. Indeed, uh, interferometers were used beginning of the 20th century already in San Francisco to check whether the Earth is moving through an ether, or is some kind of substance surrounding that or in space that carries electromagnetic waves. Because people always thought that uh, they need a carrier substance, which is not true. The ether, and there should be now a, a difference if you measure light going with the movement of the Earth or perpendicular. And the fine thing to do so is a so-called interferometer. 
What you do is you to produce light, the wavelengths. Oops, now probably I need to go to a bit of a pen. So here we produce a wave. It's a some kind of uh, wavelengths produced, and here we split it. Half of the beam goes up here, half of the beam goes here. We let it resonate in order to make this uh, wave difference larger. Let a bit of the light come back also from here. And then we see whether the light that comes here on the photo detector, whether we have them coming in phase. So this must be then a multiple of the wavelengths that this way here, but they're all the completely perfect, all the, the difference is a multiple of the wavelengths. And what happens is we add them up, we get twice the intensity. We get basically very bright, bright that perfectly hits each other constantly, but we make a bright spot that stays this way. So, or we have crest and throat and vice versa. What we have is darkness. They cancel each other over. <laughs> Strange, but well, now depending on this uh, uh, way, we get basically here in the screen this pattern, depending on the, the, the weight difference. And this is then also given by some kind of angle here. And every time the weight difference is half a wavelength, we get this annihilation effect, this cancelling effect. And if it's a multiple of the wavelengths, we add them up and we get here this pattern. If everything is stable, this pattern stays. But if now here a gravitational wave goes here through, means here we get a contraction or expansion of the length while this arm stays the same. And then we see a shift of this, what we call uh, interference patterns, the waves. We see it changing. This is certain frequency. We can easily also see how strongly is it changing. So basically this minima, how strong is it? What increasing, decreasing and so on. Basically we measure now down to something like the wavelengths, which is for light, 400 nanometers is blue light. 700 nanometers, so 10 to the minus nine meters is, is, is red light. And this on a distance of a couple of kilometers. And now we let this here 100 times resonate and this couple of kilometers becomes a couple of hundred kilometers. And suddenly we become very, very sensitive to small changes. In fact, this got so in LIGO, well, the, the arm length here is a couple of kilometers. So such an arm is then quite long. Oh. So this is then basically here. Such a, a length, well, this geo 300 in, near Hanover is only 300 meters. So the extra sensitivity it is. is does not have this long uh, uh, relative change. But LIGO benefits from it because LIGO is such a, you have to operate this vacuum, this laser beam under vacuum. To create a couple of kilometers long vacuum, you need to pump quite a lot. Otherwise, uh, the, every molecule scatters your black beam away and then you lose intensity and you need to run it very temperature stable because otherwise thermal expansion, <laughs> it's just, you want to measure a couple of hundred nanometers on the nanometer scale, 
And <laughs> your expansion is already a couple of, of centimeters. You need to run very stable terminally. And it starts with, with the mirrors that here reflect. It's a difference whether you have it uh, with light and without light. Because light, obviously, something is always absorbed, and absorbed means some, some energy coming in the system expands and, and light makes a pressure that basically pushes the, the, the mirror away. All these technical difficulties. So that's why. Oh, <laughs> ah. So this is now my explanation of the thing, and but here it's now a very very nice uh, video, which explains again this principle with the light waves adding up or cancelling away. Constructive interfering, adding up or destructive cancelling away. So please have a stop, take your five minutes, look at this video, listen nicely to the explanation. They are much better than I could ever do. Then just with you. Okay. So hopefully you have seen now this video. Of course, when you have such a system, it's never, never isolated. And we be constantly something that is uh, changing, that is making something vibrate or whatever. And then you have an earthquake going through. Earthquake is anyway means already the earth is, is periodically changing. But fortunately, this is with a relatively low frequency. So this would be the seismic noise. Then you have a train. This geo 300 is so sensitive. I know it's about 150, 200 kilometers away from the North Sea. They see when in the North Sea is a storm and the waves clash against the beach or on the, on the shores. So sensitive are they. <laughs> Every train there, somewhere within 100 kilometer, you see a bit of, of noise. So it's, then you have at some point this radiation pressure on the mirrors by the light, because you use laser light, very intense light source. Light is a particle and can also make some pressure by hammering against and being reflected. It changes its momentum. Light has no mass, but for any strange reason, it has momentum, which is given by its energy divided by the speed of light. Hmm. Something I accept it. I don't know if I ever understand this. But... Then you have uh, just mirrored thermal noise, short noise, which is a statistical. Uh... So loads of these sources. Interestingly, these mirrors, they were made by UWS. The mirrors of LIGO, the, the, not the mirrors, but the coatings of the mirrors were done at UWS. And at some point they got a new machine which worked for, ten, for any strange reason, 10 times better. An entire order of magnitude, suddenly this contribution of the noise, by the way, this is a logarithmic scale. 10, 2021, 20, this is always a factor of 10. Oh. Oh. And all this stuff, suspension terminal, this is basically the mirror, this is, this is increasing, decreasing for how to, to fix the mirror, to have it not uh, yeah, it gives you hopefully a feeling for the technical difficulties. And here is then something of the LIGO detectors. And this was uh, basically within the, the sensitivity gain from up here with a couple of technical improvements. And now, as I said, LIGO has these kilometers of, of vacuum. So you open this once, you break the vacuum, 
because pumping takes again a couple of weeks to create the vacuum that you need. So you open this once and then you make all this improvement that you can. You close the system, you pump it down and you pray that it works. <laughs> Otherwise you open it again and, and repair. They are Geo 300 as its strengths because this is much smaller. This is where you test such equipment that it really works. So you don't, you, you limit this, this pray that it everything works stage to a minimum by using the smaller facilities. Well, then, well, what happens is here on the left top side, you see now the two LIGO arms. Meanwhile, there is also Virgo running. Kalka is a facility in Japan. So again, obviously, turbine noise doesn't disturb so much because Japan is well known for its earthquakes. Same occasionally in India, which gets a third arm. Here's this Geo or Central Europe, this British-German collaboration. And the Italians have Virgo running again in earthquake zone. Yet, the first one that were operational, so 2014, 15, were LIGO. And from all this rubbish, they were looking for very specific signals. So in all this rubbish, you filter the rubbish away and then hope that you find your signal. And because it's critical, what is really signal, what not, you need at least two of them that fire at the same time, that at the same time give you signal. Otherwise, oh, there. by the way, they even check their system by occasionally whether they're analyzing filter or works by giving occasionally fake signals in. And there's now only two or three people that they're really fake. And the guys that are hopefully uh, on shift and monitor everything, when they spot such a signal, they would do the analysis, they would look at it, and then they would first ask the other guys, was this a fake or is this a candidate for a real event? Oh, and 14, September 14, 2015, mankind basically, 100 years after Einstein's prediction, succeeded to measure these very, very tiny effects. Here is from the FISREF letters, the original publication, which I wonder that they use FISREF letters, not nature. Nice of them because that's our flagship journal. If you publish there, you are good. And now you're very good because they have also published it instead of going to the super cool. Big journal, it's nice of them, they deliberately downgraded. Well, in Hanford, in Washington, so up here, so north west coast of the US and Louisiana, so relatively central, Livingston, Louisiana. Basically, they have observed the same signal, which goes through. From the noise, it appears some kind of oscillation that gets faster and faster and faster and more violent or more intense and intense, and then suddenly, whoosh, gone. But this is relatively similar. So if you if one corrects for the noise, one gets here nicely this periodic signal as predicted by the theoreticians. If you plot this as frequency over time, you get this chirp, with some chirp-like uh, sound. Orbit, 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 orbit. Oh. Absolute monumental step for us. And what was observed is basically this inspiral link. 
So the slow, the signal builds up because they are now coming closer and therefore the disturbance gets much, much, much bigger. Or then here comes basically to the merger and then the ring down. So we have then created one mass. And you see here, this is the nomenclature, GW150914. So 15, the year, then American uh, way to write down the date. And it turns out from the signal, from the shape of the signal, and especially the ring down, this is the type of signal we expected for two black holes. To merge. So basically, what the two masses that were in spiral in the meeting were two black holes. Then, from the difference in time, when the signals were detected in Hanford and in Louisiana, we could roughly at least give us this, in this case, only two biangulation. Uh, if we would have had a third one, we could have done triangulation, we could have located it relatively well. We could at least go where it was and how far it was. And then with this intensity, we could determine the masses out of. So just from this signal, basically, we get the velocity, we get the separation until here really the merger happened. And from this shape of the signal, we get out what mass, what lifetime difference. We get the masses that were involved and how far roughly it was away. So this was published in this phys physical review letters. Oh, so you see it's delayed by a couple of months. This is usually the peer review process. You, of course, you, you observe the event, you write down the paper, then you are in this big collaboration and everybody of the process wants to have it say. There are a couple of thousand people involved. Let's say there are 100 of them or guys that think they are bosses. They need to have a read through and everybody gives his, uh, yeah. you have written the paper and then you get all these comments and you think, ah. So you make the sense for changes, recirculate, and then you submit to the journal. And then the journal editor says, of course, oh, that is great. It sends it immediately to referees, so anonymous colleagues that peer review that looks through and is it sound? Is this really possible? Is this is this okay? Is this for the quality of the journal appropriate, or should it go to a lower one? <laughs> that is usually with FISREF letters. Oh, God. Okay. And then accept it. And then, of course, there's uh, people that go for the English. And, uh, and then suddenly, at some point, it's then hopefully in a stage that you say, please, 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 after have, you have read it 100 times, please, please, I don't mind if it's completely wrong. Just publish. You can't read it anymore. Oh. But that's this delay. So, and now we can look a bit more. What is plotted here is what is called the strain in something with 10 to the minus 21. And strain in their terms is defined as the change of length relative to the length. We talk now about 10 to the minus 21. So delta L over L. You know, change this S times L. And then we need use for L an astronomical unit of 1.5, 10 to the 11, 11 meters, multiplied with this 10 to the minus 21. But then we are something at 1.5, 10 to the minus 10 meters. This is about the size of an atom. Or three times the size of a hydrogen atom in the common state. Oh, oh it's about 
1.5 times, sorry. Uh, it was the radius and not the diameter. Okay, so. On this distance Earth to Sun, you observe this distance has changed by the size of a hydrogen atom. <laughs> And then uh, you, we, as, as part of mankind, we can clap our shoulders that we are able to measure so precisely. Wow, big success, isn't it? To give us a feeling. And then from the signal, we can read out from this tiny, tiny, tiny signal. We read out that the one mass that was observed had about 36, that one black hole had 36 solar masses. The second black hole had 29 solar masses. And the final object that remained had 62 solar masses. Okay. But 30, uh, 36 plus 29 is usually 65. What happened to this difference of three solar masses? This is basically the energy multiplied with C squared that has been in, invested to create gravitational waves. So this has been used to disturb space time. Energy has been uh, mass has been changed towards energy. Well, if you don't believe that this works, ask the people in Hiroshima. They have also experienced it similar. Okay, so it would be now. Usually, if it would be in class, I would show you again this uh, first observation of gravitational waves. This video. So if you want, please stop and, and have a look in this video. You also might see that uh, these lectures are built up that towards the end you have more external videos. This is then usually uh, when we would be in class and I would stand there and muffle your ears bleeding. That you get there a few minutes, one or two minutes uh, a rest from my voice. Oh, so please take a look at, and then we continue. Hopefully you enjoyed this little video. Okay. And now we have seen there is this, there is a slight difference, a couple of, micro milliseconds where the difference usually are a nanos the speed of light nanos the second corresponds to 30 centimeters <laughs> this is for us as for me as experimentalist uh, often we need uh, uh, to make delays that we de delay one signal relative to another and all we do is this use cable of a length three meters are a nanoseconds delay. Okay. Oh, so from this delay time of the observation, one can then using this kind of triangulation, then one could narrow basically, uh, if we unfold the night sky, we could narrow down the region where this event has happened. And we can narrow down basically the distance where it happened by the combination of lifetime and signal height. So then December 26, so basically for Christmas, they got another event, the second event. Whoa. If you observe a thing once, well, it's, it's, it's okay, but second time, then you, you're sure, okay, you know, our method really works. The first time, it might be just that you are talking nonsense. Of course, I don't want to say that these colleagues in this collaboration would ever do so. 
hope you are quite confirmed that your oh, next event, yes. And the second event is at Christmas. Well, the first event we could also see it was 1.3 billion light years away. This was about the time, happened at the time, again, they, they traveled with the speed of light, 1.3 billion years ago, all life was still in the sea. It was about the time when uh, this monocellular life, or perhaps we had already developed a bit higher organisms. But were there really uh, fishes already? Nevertheless, so is this an end product of 62 solar masses. And then sensitivity obviously had already been increased because 1.4 billion light years away is the second event, so slightly further away. It involved only 21 solar masses. So far, so good. We had them. This was again two black holes merging. The first year, it was already a surprise that we found. We always thought that the, or the astronomers thought black holes there are a couple of solar masses, maybe ten solar masses. That's it. And we have this supermassive of millions of solar masses in the centers of galaxies. But this intermediate size of 30, 40 solar masses, this was a, a bit of a surprise. And obviously, they are not so, they're quite frequent. And then January 4th, 1970. Uh, 2017 happened the event or the next event that was relatively important and I'm not sure whether this is the one that interests me because no this is not the event that I'm interested in because these were no big masses but black holes I'm very interested in learning about nuclear matters. But the biggest nucle atomic nuclear that we have are neutron stars. This is a very extreme form of nuclear matter. So stuff that I'm interested in. And when we have them merging, this is the really, for us, interesting thing. You have loads of neutrons around. Oh, that is what you want, at least what I want. And a violent event. And oh, we even learn about uh, how can they polarize by the form of the signal. Okay. But now, well, gravitational wave there exists, even catalog of all the events. And here, this is the one that interests me. You see a completely different form of the signal, far more spiraling or far different. The tube is much, much longer. And these were then two neutron stars merging. <laughs> yeah, big event. And you see just this year, this is 2015 to 2017. Oh, at some point, it's pretty standard. The first one or two or three, that maybe this uh, binary neutron star merger has been reported. Uh, and when I have uh, uh, last checked, they made on, on Wikipedia a big list of gravitational wave observations. And at this date, it was 90 events. Oh. There's a certain probability and perhaps even more. Oh. 
you have seen these extreme small waveforms, you need to get it out of this, all this other noise that you have constantly around. So, then you can now see here, this is also quite interesting. You get basically the false alarm rate relative towards the uh, true event chain uh, stuff. In terms of distance, mega parsec, so millions of parsec is 3.5 or three light years. Well, my deploy this with 3.3 in the new in terms of light years, in terms of uh, the events. Then you see uh, also plotted black hole, black hole, and so on. And also how the this time basically the, the false event rate increases. The more sensitive you are, the more often you might have something that false alarms. <laughs> so, and for me, it's B and S, that's the important stuff. So this is very likely this one was the binary neutron stars. So this would be LIGO. And, and LIGO is terrestrial, you have all these noise. Why not avoid this? And we have seen that the arm length which is obviously the earth limited. You cannot make a 1000 kilometer tunnel that is straight on. Just with the earth surface, you would need to dig already. In. So you are limited with the length of the arms. And you have seen this is Louis Yana, who lives in Louis Yana. They built there a couple of kilometer long structures. Try to do this in the UK. Try to do this in Central Europe, forget about. So why not going somewhere where space doesn't matter? So this will be the future idea of gravitational wave observatories. And I think it has been already agreed for the, the money to be that it's going to be built. And this is LISA, the laser interferometer space antenna. So here we basically work with three arms, which has an advantage because with this two arm design, okay, so okay. with the two arm design, you have one problem. Oh. If the gravitational wave comes this direction, the strain in this direction is the same as in here. So your net effect that you can in the end see as difference of these changes is in zero. You're blind, you're blind, you're blind, you're blind. So and this happened during this, uh, Binary neutron star merge. There were already two LIGOs on, going on and the Italian logo. And there we also had this is binary neutron star merge. We have also detected a flash of, of half radiation of X rays, gamma rays by a satellite, a Fermi satellite. Had. Basically, it, in fact, it had seen this and then it asked, they, these guys asked at LIGO, have you seen an event? I checked, said, oh, yeah, even two seconds before you. Gravitational wave come directly out. The light was still trapped because everything was so, so monstrous and so dense. And then only when it flew apart, the light could. So and the crack was, to, it was nice coming in for the two LIGO orbs. But for Virgo, it was blind. It came from one of these angles. If we would have had three, we could have made triangulation, could nicely limit it down. And so we could only narrow down. It took longer than it needed to, to point, here it is. Here's the new bright spot that wasn't there before. 
Oh. But in the end, what they used was the information that they hadn't seen it, that it was coming from one of these blind spots. Uh, okay, oops. Wait, that was too far. So the future is going to be Lisa and up. No, I'm too stupid. Oops, no, I don't want to close this. Ah, sorry. As usual, you see me struggling and hopefully you are amused. There's no point now, let's go back. Slideshow from current slide. Okay, so this is the future of computational wave astronomy. And here, this structure now basically eliminates almost that you have these blind spots are minimized. We have these three satellites basically with laser and uh, returning, and they are now in a distance of 5 million kilometers. Already, this uh, L is bigger. Or, where, when you have a wave of quite some length, no. then you have a wave of quite some length. But you observe only on such a length. So obviously, the relative changes, while if you observe on a far length, longer, the relative change is bigger. That's why also it matters this arm length. Oh. And where it's positioned, well, the Earth will rotate around the Sun. And it's going relative behind the Earth, moving behind the Earth, around the Earth's uh, orbit, extending basically one inside even the uh, Venus orbit. It's quite already something. It will cost, of course, something, but it will be so sensitive. We hope at the very beginning when the universe was expanding very fast, there were primordial gravitational waves created. We hope that we see this background of gravitational waves that should be everywhere. Okay, hopefully this lecture was no relatively abstract and, and demanding. But hopefully it, it gave you a feeling, how do we observe now this, this type of violent events when two massive mass, masses merge? How do we, we think that space is built up? With this, I would say it's enough for this week. Next week, we continue with how to measure distances. I think so. See you then.